This orientation is a great starting point for most families. We're gonna cover different types of timelines and all different things that are involved in the success of your total senior year. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what this webinar looks like, um, what's gonna be linked and readily available for you and what our game plan is for this evening. So in this presentation, there will be a lot of linked resources. That also saves us time so that if there's something that you'd like to look at later or reference at a different time, you can go back and do that. Um, if you see the link icon, that means that there is a link or resource for you on the slide page. Because this is a webinar format, your cameras and your microphones are turned off. We can't see you or hear you. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to submit them there. I would highly recommend that you wait until the end of the presentation to ask questions, just because we might answer most of, of what you're most pressed about during our, our time together. Um, but if there is something that comes up that you feel like is, is super time sensitive or super relevant, please feel free to put it in the Q&A um, and we'll be able to answer it for everyone. Um, this presentation is the first that we are doing as a part of our team for the year. It is one of many that will be available to you. Um, towards the end of the presentation this evening, I'll actually go over the additional senior supports and resources that we have built into the fall semester so that you all understand exactly what our plan is to help support you through this process. So in the meantime, hang tight and let's look over our agenda for this evening. So this is the Futurology team. My name again is Kristen Jones Manning. I'm joined here by B and Monica. Um, we are your district college and career counselors. We work as a part of college admissions in terms of reading applications and preparing students for applications. Um, everything that we do as a part of our program is data-driven. Our hours vary um, from Monday through Friday, and then we host appointments through September and May. Currently, we have options to meet with students online via Zoom, just like this. Um, at school sites at some of our college and career centers that opened this year and also at our satellite office at the Mall at Mission View. Um, all of the things that we're hosting, this webinar appointments included, are completely free of cost to all families from CUSD. So if this is your very first time interacting with our team, welcome, we're so happy you're here. If you've been able to see any of our presentations before, you know kind of what to expect and what we're gonna be doing this evening but we hope that we're able to answer a lot of your questions and set you up for a really successful start to what you're planning as a senior. So tonight we're going to talk about future planning requirements. And I say future because we are definitely touching on college and a lot of the aspects that are involved with applying to college, but not every student is on that path. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we're gonna talk about what are future planning requirements as a student that you should know about. Um, understanding the guidelines to building your college list, different application timelines, the testing options review, because testing options have changed um, over the time of COVID and in terms of admissions, there are some different options that you have. We're gonna do a quick financial aid overview. We're gonna talk about letters of recommendation. We're gonna talk about essays, and then we're gonna have time for Q&A at the end. Um, it is a very, very packed agenda. So we are gonna move quickly. Like I said, most, Slides are going to have a linked resource for you to be able to access after the presentation is over if you have more questions about a specific topic. Um, so I hope that that is already built in. It will be super helpful to you after we finish. So let's do a quick poll. I want to make sure that we check in with everybody and see how you're doing for this, you know, within the start of school. We've just started back. It's been a week and a half, technically, since today's Wednesday. How are you feeling you know, about the start of school, planning for your post high school life? And then also as you're thinking about your future, what are the things that you feel like you're most concerned about? We definitely wanna be able to address some of those things, be able to help you answer some of those questions. So it'd be nice to know how all of you are feeling tonight. Have a lot of really wonderful responses. I'm going to give us a couple more minutes, actually one more minute to have everybody chime in. These polls are anonymous, so your names are not associated with your answers. They're definitely just to help us understand where you're at, what you're feeling right now, and how we can plan to help you do some, some of these things. All right, I'm going to end this poll in three, two, 
one. Okay, so let's share some of these results. A lot of you are reporting that you're nervous about your plans. That's totally normal. <laughs> I think most seniors, most students that I've talked to in the past year feel really nervous about what they're gonna do after high school. Even going back to high school um, full-time is something that they've been really considering and considerate about. So that's very, very typical at this stage in planning for you all to feel a little bit nervous. That's okay. That's what we're here to help you support. Um, a lot of you reported that your biggest concerns are about, you know, you don't necessarily know where to start, just getting into college and then completing your actual applications. I hope that our presentation tonight definitely covers a lot of those pieces of information, specifically, where do I start? Um, and we will definitely talk about some resources that we have coming up for writing your essays or writing supplements as a part of your applications and also completing your actual college applications itself. So I really appreciate you all answering and being honest. That helps us so much. Let's keep moving. So now we're just gonna do a quick A through G and transcript overview. Um, most of you have, as seniors, understand or have heard what A through G is, but I want to make sure that we are touching on it so that you understand what requirements are still in place, are still the same, and what maybe has changed or could differ with your application cycle. So A through G requirements are a selection of courses that are paced out throughout your time in high school. They are required to apply to a four-year institution, in the state of California and typically out of state to any other four-year institution as well. These on your screen are the minimum requirements. So you need to have history and social science, English courses, math, your lab sciences, your language other than English, a visual performing art, and your college prep elective courses. You'll see that the little arrows indicate that most students have more than the minimum requirement. Um, and I think that that's very typical of students throughout CUSD. So your A through Gs are a part of your application process in the sense that they are a minimum requirement that you need to meet. Most students actually go above and beyond that pretty easily. Um, within CUSD, for example, all students take at least three years of social, excuse me, social studies as a part of their regular course progression. Um, so that's one class that you're already doing above the minimum. Other classes that students typically take will be an additional lab science, an additional year of their language, an additional elective, anything like that. These are just a reference for you. If you haven't taken a look at your transcript, if you're not exactly sure what A through G requirements are, your A through G requirements will be a part of your application process. For your CSU application, if you're applying to a Cal State school, you'll actually have to match those classes. Um, but we'll come back to these in a little bit. So to understand your A through G and to maximize your options for post high school, what we really hope that you take away from this part of the presentation is that maintaining your minimum A through G requirements is critical. Um, I have students every year who ask, you know, can I drop my math class? I really don't wanna take math anymore. Do I need to take this extra year of foreign language? Do I have to take this art class? And the general answer is yes, you do need to keep all of those courses to maximize your options. Um, this includes that your courses or your grades in your A through G courses, excuse me, need to be a C or better. Some of you might have a credit or no credit or a pass, no pass from our previous grading scales um, that we used at the very, very beginning of COVID. That's okay too. Um, the goal in admissions is making sure that you're meeting those minimum requirements per subject area and that they're reflected on your transcript. So that includes your senior year courses. So your sen senior year English, your senior Gov and Econ classes, all of those are a part of your A through G requirements. And so they are really important that you understand that those are still going to be considered and factor into your overall application. And Kristen, if I may, if I may add to that um, regarding, you know, students who are asking, should I maximize, you know, come senior year, should I take that extra year of science or math? Um, we always recommend that you push yourself, but you know yourself best and you know your limits, right? So you know your bandwidth and if your stress level is at a nine out of 10 and that class is gonna take you to a 10, then maybe we don't do that, right? And so um, above all else, you need to value where your head's at and where your mind and body are at first and foremost. Um, and if you feel like you can handle it, then by all means, we definitely recommend it. 
Absolutely, thank you. There are some links on this page for majors, um, for the Cal States and UCs. Um, if you'd like more information about how to know which colleges have which majors um, or programs that are open, those are linked on, on this slide as well. Um, moving on to the next slide, a lot of students have questions about their transcript and where do they find information on their transcript. This is a screenshot of what your portal actually looks like as a student or parent. Within your transcript view, you're able to see your weighted 10 through 12 GPA and also your decile rank and your total class size. For most of the applications that you'll complete if you're completing an application for college, community college or a four-year institution, they're gonna ask you some basic information like this. Um, typically in California, our colleges are really focused on their weighted 10 through 12 GPA. That's the one that's right here in the middle. You'll report both your unweighted and your weighted GPA. You'll also maybe be asked to report your decile rank or your class rank um, and maybe the size of your total class. We don't individually rank within CUSD, so there's not one student out of 650, or this class is 607. Um, you're ranked in a decile, which is a 10 percentile. So a decile two would be in the top 20% of, of that student's class. Um, we get a lot of questions, especially for students that are filling out four-year college applications about where to find this information. I promise you it's on your student portal. Um, you can also download unofficial copies of your transcript, all of the classes that you've taken, those, those are all on there for you to access, um, but we'll definitely talk a little bit more specifically later about how to order transcripts and the process of making sure that all of that is complete. So let's talk a little bit about what post-secondary options there are for students who are interested in planning for life post high school. There's definitely more than one way to do anything, just like life. Um, so in CUSD, we have a few different trends that we see among students. So you have a lot of different options to choose from. College is definitely the most popular, but it's not the only option for students. Um, our averages across CUSD seniors is that about 77% of our seniors in CUSD go on to higher education. And that's split between directly to a four-year institution and then going to a community college there are still about 23% of students who choose not to go to college and they choose either a certificate or vocational program, they begin working a job, they take a break or a gap year or they enlist in the military. So I want all of those students to know if they're listening here tonight, we're definitely gonna wade through a lot of information about college applications, but we're here for you as well. You know, there's still a little bit of planning involved in making those options become a reality and we're definitely here to support whatever your dreams or aspirations are post high school. Another really awesome fact about our general CUSD population is about 20% of our high school students are the first in their family to attend college. Um, so it's a really awesome time to be excited about what's, what's ahead, what's coming up. Um, and you're definitely not the only one if you're gonna be a first gen student. So we're happy that you're here. So in discussing what post-secondary options look like, um, this is a part of the presentation that I, I wanna shout out that I'm speaking to both students and parents when we discuss this information because it is important for both parties to understand. So students are really starting to feel like they're transitioning into adulthood. You know, if most of you are back on campus for the first time in a while, you're you're the big people on campus now. You know, there's a whole freshman class or sophomore class that maybe you haven't even been acquainted with yet. Um, this is really where it starts. You know, we talk a lot about senioritis and senior activities, but a lot of that is what you're leading up to, you know, feeling this transition of, I feel like I'm gonna be done with this chapter and this other new chapter is opening for me. Because of that, there are different regulations about how your application cycle will work. One of those is within FERPA. FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Protections Act, and it requires that students' information is protected from the time they're 18 or upon graduation from high school. The one caveat from that is that it actually begins with your college application process. So as a parent, if you wanna support your student through this application cycle, if you have a question about completing an application, if a transcript was submitted, if you call on behalf of your student, 
more than likely the college will not release any information to you as a parent because of these FERPA laws and rights. They belong to your student. Um, what I recommend for most families is that they begin having conversations about how this is going to work within your own family dynamic. So what can you, you know, feel really confident in trusting your student to do on their own? Um, and what are some things or ways that you can support your student without overstepping into those ways that might interfere with their FERPA laws or make everyone frustrated? Um, one of the things that I recommend the most, and students, if you take anything from this presentation at all, I hope it is this please check your email. Check your email all the time. Check your email as much as you can to make sure that you're not missing anything. You don't need to stalk your email necessarily, but I promise you there will be a lot of really wonderful information in there. Every year I have students who don't know they've been accepted somewhere or haven't heard from a college and find it in their spam or find it in their email folder two weeks later. Um, your college will primarily contact you via email. Um, so please establish one that is college appropriate, we hope, um, and that is something that you're gonna check on a regular basis. One of the unfortunate things of having a CAPO email within CUSD is that you don't actually have an email account associated with that login. So your at CAPO USD email is not a real email. There's not an inbox or a Google Drive that's associated with it. It's really just a login. So if there is a personal email that you utilize, or if there's one that you don't, please make sure you know which one you're going to be using for your applications or for your planning, and you can try to use that one consistently and regularly, okay? The other part that I hate to mention, but I do feel is necessary, is to make sure that your social media presence is as neutral and considerate as it can be. Um, your admissions process includes conditional admission, which means to a certain extent, you, the college has until you deposit to decide if that admission option stands or if they can take it away. I have unfortunately had students' admissions offers rescinded, meaning that after some of their social media came to light or some things that they put out into TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, um, were against the ethics codes or moral codes of the institution that they wanted to go to. They were no longer allowed to attend that institution. Um, you know, don't miss out on opportunities because of a lack of, of, of maturity. Um, try your best to really evaluate, is this something that I really feel like is necessary to put out in the world or, you know, be cognizant of, of what those things are. And I'll, I'll leave that at that. So in addition to understanding some of those basic things about what will be transitioning into your planning options, really researching what those options are is key. So understanding which options might be the best fit for you is a really great part of your senior year planning. This slide has several links um, that include, you know, what is the difference between a major and a minor? What types of college degrees are out there, including What's the difference between an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree, a bachelor's degree, or a master's degree? All of those types of things. Um, there's a great chart that explains the differences in each of the higher education systems within California. So the community college systems, private colleges, four-year institutions, the CSU and the UC, all of that stuff. There's a great alternative pathway and military information handout that includes all the different branches of the military, all the different alternative paths that students take outside of college. So there's a lot of great info here if you're still on the fence or undecided about anything that you're planning for your life after high school. So there are definitely types of college options, like I mentioned. In California, these are the three that are the most frequent. So we have two very large public four-year institution systems. One is the UC system and one is the California State University system. They are wildly different from each other. And we're gonna talk about that actually in a webinar that's coming up on the 29th. So in September, if you wanna learn a lot more about those two systems, we'll be talking extensively about it then. Um, the UC system is made up of nine campuses. It is designed for the top 9% of California students. It has a mix of graduate and undergraduate degree programs, and it has a very specific research focus. The Cal State system is much larger in terms of campuses. It's 23 campuses. There are three designated polytechnic campuses. It's designated for students to have local options. So we actually have local Cal States that our district is a feeder to. Uh, the majority of their students are undergraduate students. 
and they have an applied skilled focus. The community college system is actually the largest of all the systems that we have in California. It's over 116 campuses. It's home to certificate programs. The first two years of your undergraduate degree, trades and more. Um, students, even if you're considering a trade or um, an apprenticeship or vocational program, a lot of them have moved into the housing of a community college system. So don't rule that out just yet if you think that that's something that you're interested in learning more about, it might actually be within your local community college system. So let's talk about guidelines for building your college list. There are a lot of things to consider as you begin this process. If you attended any of our college list jumpstart workshops last spring as a junior, we discussed these in depth. If you weren't able to attend those, we're definitely gonna go through rapid fire more of the specific information that you can consider and there will be a lot of links in these slides as well. So one of the things that most students understand and don't necessarily apply right away is this concept of fit. Like what is college fit? Um, college admissions is really a matching game. Not every student is going to be a good fit for every school regardless of their admissions chances. Um, evaluating what you want as a student out of your college experience, and if that is a match with each individual school that you're considering, is really some of the most basic fundamental planning um, that you can do as a senior. We have a really great um, article that's linked on this side about fit over rankings and why we don't use rankings in college admissions to help our students determine where they might apply or where their best fit might be and what college fit actually means. Um, one of the pieces of information that's built into this article discusses that college engagement or what a student does with their opportunity is so much more impactful than the ranking or qualification of any particular college that they apply to. Um, and we find that in a longitudinal style research to be true. Um, you know, it's really what you make of your opportunities or what you make of your experiences versus the name brand or title that's associated with any university that you apply to or choose to attend. This is one of the most fundamental pieces of building your college list, and I'm actually going to pass it along to my colleague, B, who's going to talk a lot more about this process. Thank you, Kristen. And actually, this um, talking about fit reminds me of one of um, our former colleagues' uh, anecdotes about her time at UCLA. She had a dorm mate who went to UCLA and lived with her in the dorm and just despised every day at UCLA, and she couldn't figure out why because you know, our colleague, Jen, was going to football games and getting involved and in clubs, and her roommate just wasn't. She was going to class, going back to her dorm room, doing her homework, and she was super homesick. And she discovered, you know, as, as you know, throughout the year that actually it wasn't a good fit for her, that she missed her home, she missed where she was from, and she just didn't fit into the, the campus culture. So that's a really good example of why fit is so important, right? So let's talk about fit for a little bit and what that means. Um, again, fit over rankings. Let's just remember that phrase, okay? Because it's not about the top 40, the top 50 in the country. It's not about US news uh, college rankings, okay? This is a very personal decision that you're gonna make that's gonna impact the next four, five years of your life, right? So we need to make sure that the colleges that you're choosing that end up on that final list of yours really aligns with your core values and beliefs, right? These are some questions that you can ask yourself. And these are just a few questions that we want you to start considering as you think about colleges that are really gonna matter to you and that are gonna work for you. Every single one of these questions are actually hyperlinked. So when you receive the slides of the orientation after tonight, you can click on that and it'll take you to a worksheet or a handout or a resource uh, to dive a bit deeper, okay? But when we talk about FIT, um, we're thinking about a few things, right? Some of the questions on the screen, right? Does it have the major that I'm interested in? Very important academic factor to consider. It should have the things that you want to study, right? And that's an academic fit factor that we need to consider. Does it align with what I value in a college experience, right? Um, does this college offer extracurriculars, clubs, uh, research opportunities, student organizations that align with what I'm passionate about and what I um, pursue in my, you know, life outside of school. 
Another question is, have I reflected about what I want my college experience to include? That's a very broad one, but have you thought about that? Do you wanna be close to home? Do you wanna be in um, six feet of snow in Syracuse, New York, right? Is that the kind of life you want for yourself um, in the winter? Uh, that's environmental, that's social, right? Um, so these are just some things to get like the brain juices flowing as you're thinking about what you want out of the school. If you think about this now and you really do some soul searching now, the chances of you succeeding and being happy when you get into that college and when you go to that college will increase, okay? Um, so let's keep those things in mind. Let's keep those fit factors in mind. We are going to link eventually in the slide to a webinar that we did a couple of years ago on fit factors on, uh, it's called the Beginner's Guide to College uh, Fit. And we strongly encourage you to look at that because it'll do a deep dive into the factors that you should be considering as you build your list, okay? So that was fit factors. That is, am I gonna learn well? Am I gonna be happy and feel like I belong on campus? Financial fit was something that I didn't touch upon in that last slide, but it's something to discuss with our families as well is can I afford it, right? How are we gonna make this work? What scholarships do they have available? How can I go here and not put myself in an inordinate amount of debt, right? Um, so those are fit factors. Another thing we need to consider is when you have your college list, when you've assessed your values and what you want out of school and you have this list, we need to make sure that it is balanced, right? So what does a balanced college list look like? Um, let's talk about that, right? Some of you have heard the terms reach, target, and safety, right? Um, maybe not all of you, but these are terms that we use to help categorize the balance of your college list. And quick plug, um, our team is providing college list check-ins online um, coming up uh, in the month of September for our seniors, okay? So if you have a college list and you want us to take a look at it and help you decide what its balance level is, then sign up on our website so that we can meet with you and um, have that discussion with you, okay? So reach target and safety, what does that mean? When you're assessing the balance of your list, we want you to use numerical quantities. We want you to use those numbers, quantitative factors, right? Um, so we want you to be able to use things like the admission rate of the school. That's going to be a huge tell, everybody, uh, when it comes to is this, is this school going to be a reach for me, right? Red light, reach, stop, like, whoa, put the brakes on this. Uh, my chances of getting in are not that great, right? That's why it's in red. Um, are my chances pretty good? Am I competitive? Which would put you in the target zone. Um, or is the school a safety school where I'm really competitive? They accept a lot of students. And in addition to that, my GPA aligns with the average student getting in and my test scores, if they are accepting test scores, also align with the students getting in or they far exceed them. Now we have some percentages on the screen for you, okay? Reach schools, we're saying they accept less than 30 to 35% of applicants. This is a general number. It's pretty applicable to most students, but just keep in mind that every student has different qualifications and a different academic history and a different extracurricular history. So does this number, do these percentages on the screen apply to absolutely everybody across the board always? No, not necessarily. But this is going to be just the, the gauge that we're gonna have you use for now um, until you can meet with a counselor or somebody to, to get some concrete um, support and um, to get some, some more um, just have somebody look at your list and give you a second set of eyes, okay? Um, target schools then fall between 35 and 70% of acceptance and then safety schools accept 80% or more of their students. Again, these are um, just example numbers, right? Um, we can certainly help you dive a little bit deeper into that. So as far as college admissions goes, right? We focus a lot on the top 50. If I were to ask all of you to name 20 colleges in the country, I bet um, most of you would name uh, similar colleges because we're very focused on brand name schools. The good news is that there are almost 4,000 degree granting institutions in this country alone. So I assure you that there is an option out there that suits you, that meets your needs uh, above and beyond, okay? And they might be schools that you've never heard of, which is why it's so important for you to go to our college fair, October 18th to 21st, to explore other options out there in addition to the uh, schools that you already know of, okay? But most colleges accept on average two thirds or more of their applicants in this country. 
So the ones that were fixated on are some of the most selective ones, right? About 40 of those highly selected schools only accept about 10% of applicants or less. That's extremely competitive. That would be a reach for everybody. Um, and it's a reach just by virtue of the fact that the admission rate is so low, okay? So we need to keep that in mind. Um, so just to sum it all up, right? When you're creating your list, you want it to be balanced. We want you to have a smattering of reach schools, maybe a couple, right? A nice, a nice number of target schools, four to six maybe. Um, and then also a good number of safety schools, three to four. Those numbers are um, kind of, you know, going to vary by student, but we want you to focus your list on target and safety schools, right? And obviously choose some reach schools if they meet all of your other fit factors, um, but what we don't want is the list full of reach schools. Um, so again, some linked resources for you that you can take a look at later. Again, if it's underscored, that means that there's a link that you can click on um, to further your uh, college selection process and how to build a balanced list, okay? So just make sure to take a look at these resources, especially that webinar on the Beginner's Guide to College Search. Uh, we do a deep dive into fit factors, into safety target and reach and what that means. Um, the next two slides are going to be a lot of information. Um, these are some things that you can start to do to build your college list, right? We're gonna, um, we provide a lot of resources for you on what to consider. Um, really initially it's about assessing your values and it's about really asking yourself what you want out of college. Um, we have to get a better understanding of where you are, of what you need as a learner and as a person um, before you can really start diving into colleges um, and building that concrete list, right? Um, there are some search engines on the screen that you see here that you'll have access to that you can use. These are resources and sources that we really trust. Um, College Express, College Raptor, Big Future, these are reliable data sources, all right? These are sources that our team has vetted and we, um, we back. So if you want a reliable source to search for colleges, these three search engines are definitely recommended. Um, once you've kind of assessed yourself and um, started looking for colleges using these reliable search engines, right? Um, you're gonna do a deeper dive. You're gonna go on virtual campus tours. Maybe you'll even go on in-person campus tours, um, depending on the campus and your ability to visit, right? Um, but virtual tours are available to everybody all the time, always. So that's a really a good start. Um, and then finally, we have some resources for you about selective colleges, um, their recommendations for admissions and for planning um, and additional resources, again, on balance, on what reach, target, and safety means so that you can be an expert in that yourself and assess yourself and your stats compared to the students getting into the school um, so that you can determine for yourself if your list is balanced and then you can run it um, by your counselor, your advisor, um, or one of us, okay, to make sure that it's balanced. So that was a lot about college admissions and uh, a quick run through on that for you, right? And that's for those of you who are planning to apply to a four year. Let's talk about community colleges because so many of our students will go off to community college and it's such a great option, not only to transfer to a university, right? Um, after two years at the community college level, it's a great way for um, you to obtain a certificate uh, to obtain an associate's degree, which is a two-year college degree from one of our local community colleges. So whatever your plans are, a community college is definitely something that you'll want to consider as a really viable and a really affordable option, okay? We have three um, big names on the screen, Saddleback, OCC, and IVC. Most of you have heard of those schools. Um, there are so many more community colleges in our area for you to explore. And you should understand that you have options. You are not limited to just the closest community college to you. This is a college. Those fit factors still apply to you. Your values still apply to the community college search. Um, make sure to join our community college showcase uh, during our college fair week. It's a virtual showcase and we'll be showcasing a number of local community colleges so that you can compare and so that you can ask the rep questions on the spot, okay? Um, Every community college has different programs. They're known for different things. Santa Ana College has a great program for those of you who wanna become firefighters, right? That's what's unique about Santa Ana College. Um, Saddleback has a great nursing program, right? 
So these are things that you should be doing research on to make sure that whatever community college you choose to go to, if that's your route, that it meets your academic and social needs. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is the Program Finder, okay, it's linked on the slide. Program Finder is an excellent source for you to use to explore what different programs are available at what different campuses throughout community colleges uh, in the state, okay, in the, actually in the, in the county, excuse me. Um, so you're gonna wanna use this to look up uh, if they have a music production program, if they have a nursing program, if they have a culinary program, a cosmetology program, this is a great way just to type in your interest and to get a list of schools that offer that particular program. So some of you in here may have heard of something called the California Promise Program, okay? Um, this is unique to California community colleges, and this was introduced through Assembly Bill 19, uh, which was signed into law on, in 2017, went into effect 2018, okay? So California Promise, you might know it as free college, right? Um, essentially what it is, is um, it allows community colleges to use some allocated money that they get to help students access college. And a lot of these colleges may have um, the option, they all have the option um, to use it to help you pay for tuition and fees. And in fact, most of the colleges who take advantage of this um, do use it to help students pay for tuition and fees. Uh, the colleges that you saw on the screen earlier, Saddleback, OCC, IVC, they all have a promise program that guarantees uh, free tuition and fees for first time, full time, uh, college students who complete a financial aid application. Um, eligibility and requirements will differ by community college. Some might say, well, um, you know, we require that you maintain a certain GPA to stay in this program to receive this fee waiver um, for the next two years, right? Um, some might say that you have to meet with a counselor once a semester, once you're admitted into the community college. Um, so just make sure that when you're doing your research, that you pull up that college's promise uh, program to see what the eligibility requirements are and what you have to do to maintain that status to ensure that you have free tuition for the time that you're in the program. Uh, keep in mind that this isn't a guarantee at every single community college. They do have the right to use the, that funding in different ways. It's just that most colleges are going to use it to give you free tuition, but you really should be doing your research as you're looking into community colleges to see um, what the eligibility requirements are, okay? Uh, definitely a great option and makes college so affordable. So keep that in mind. Um, in uh, keeping with the community college conversation, Counseling 100 is a course that you can take in the spring. It's offered uh, through Saddleback College and it allows high school students to basically prepare to be a successful student in college. It's gonna teach you how to register for classes, how to choose a major, how to explore programs that colleges offer. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to get um, some college units, right, 1.5 units uh, for the course. It's offered in the spring, and it's a great way for you to get a jump on preparing for community college and just getting all of your ducks in, the, in a row if this is something that you want to pursue. So finally, just some last bits for me as far as community college go, okay? Um, Saddleback counselors are going to be available at your campus to meet with you to discuss this transition and the application process. Please take advantage of their expertise. Um, they are going to be the experts in what do I do to apply to Saddleback? How do I get into that Saddleback specifically, right? Um, so schedule an appointment with them. They should be on campuses. If not now, then very soon. Go to your guidance office. Um, to figure out how to schedule with them to get their expert advice, okay, on transitioning to community college. Um, remember that community college searches require the same energy as searching for a four-year college. Like I said earlier, fit factors matter. This is college. So you need to make sure that you're choosing a program that aligns with your personal values. Uh, as Kristen mentioned earlier, FERPA laws apply. So this is when you start entering the world of adulthood, everybody, right? This is when you take control of your education, when you take the reins and you're monitoring your email, you're making sure that you've completed orientation and matriculation and all of that stuff that you do when you're applying to community college. Um, but this means that your information is yours and it's not necessarily shared with your parents, okay? So this is gonna have to teach you some autonomy um, and some responsibility. And again, as Kristen mentioned earlier, check your emails obsessively, uh, develop that habit.
And with that, I'm going to pass this on to my colleague, Monica, to talk to you about application timelines and support. Monica, if you don't mind, I just want to clarify one question that we had come in the Q&A that I think is really important. So with the passing of AB 19, the bill that supports the fee waiver for students at the community college, your parent income is typically not a factor in qualifying for that waiver. Um, so it's not based on your parent, parent income or family income like other types of financial aid. Um, it's set aside money and funds that are specifically for first time college students. So almost all students will qualify. There are some um, special circumstances or instances where that cannot happen. One example of that is if a student attends a four year university, comes back home and then goes to the community college because they've already enrolled in a higher education institution, they would not be considered a first time college student. That's a really specific example, um, but I just wanted to clarify before we jump into timelines that that funding is for every California student. So it's definitely a great option like we mentioned. Thank you, Kristen, for clarifying that for everybody. Um, so hi, everybody. I am going to be talking to all of you about application timelines and what are some things you should consider as we start college application season. Um, so hopefully these will give you um, a good sense and hopefully will give you a lot of time to plan. Um, so four types of application. So typically, you know, um, students are going to be applying to community college and univer uh, universities uh, during this time. Uh, for university applications specifically, um, these are the most common one, coalitions and the common app. Those are, these are the common um, applications that you will see. Um, for students in California, you know, a lot of students do apply for the UCs and the CSU. So for the coalition and the common app, those uh, uh, platforms are going to host a lot of different campuses, a lot of different schools. So that's why there is a lot of deadlines and a lot of timelines that you have to consider. So if there is a school that you're interested in, they're on those um, uh, platforms that you can apply to those schools through those platforms, and you'll have to uh, make sure that you um, are aware of those deadlines. For the UC app, um, the application's open already, um, but submission period doesn't start until November 1st. So you can start on the application, but you can actually submit it until um, November 1st, and you'll have until November 30th to submit that. And then for the CSU, um, it's closed now, but it'll open on October 1st and it'll run through November 30th. Um, now, uh, let's talk about, oh, and actually I do wanna say a couple more things about the UC and the CSU apps. So for the UC apps, you can apply to all nine campuses through that one application. You'll just select which campuses you are interested in applying to and you just submit that one application. And same as for the CSU, you can apply to um, any of the 23 campuses through that one application. So you don't have to apply to each campus individually. Um, for the community college application, so a lot of students and families assume that, you know, there is no, um, specific timeline that you should follow in terms of community college applications, but that's not the case. Most of these, um, um, you know, they'll do have rolling dates and deadlines, but typically for uh, fall enrollment, fall 2022, which is all of you seniors here, you'll enroll in fall 2022 at community colleges, um, maybe some of you summer, but typically it's for fall 2022. Um, those open as early as October and November. So right in the middle of, you know, college application season. So you still have a very similar timeline. Um, that Counseling 100 class that B mentioned earlier, also the registration for that opens in this, you know, this, around the same time. Um, so you'll have, again, similar timeline as far as like, there is a lot of deadlines coming up in those, those months or, you know, those, some of those timelines start during those months. Um, and then also the freshman and advantage, uh, freshman advantage and promise pro promise program, um, B mentioned the promise program earlier, those programs are going to be, you know, their deadlines are going to be in early April. So again, you want to pay attention. There is a, a specific timeline. If you are a community college track student, um, or, you know, you want to consider community college, there is a specific timeline. So I don't think B mentioned freshman advantage, but I'll mention it just really quick. So um, if you uh, want to be part of the freshman advantage program, the benefit of that program is um, you get prior registration. If you complete, um, you know, matriculate, which means, you know, you follow the whole process of applying for community college, you'll get prior registration. What that means is you'll get to apply, you'll get to enroll 
in um, community college classes early on. So that means you may you may have more opportunities for you to actually enroll in the classes that you need or that you want. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for first time freshman students, um, college students, um, so that you don't miss out on the classes that you want to take. Um, so yeah, those are, that's it on those those two. Okay, so um, Kristen mentioned earlier, you know, some of the post secondary options. So I want to kind of go more into detail about the um, the specific deadlines and the timelines for these different options. So for four year bound students, typically the season will start, you know, at, around this month and go through um, November. Uh, but for some like out of state schools, private schools, uh, you may see that those deadlines to apply for the, those campuses are in January. So it depends on what you have, what colleges you're interested in. Um, but typically the app college application season runs through August, it starts in August and runs through November. Um, our recommendation though, is that, you know, you finalize your applications around Thanksgiving, um, you know, that so that you can actually enjoy um, your Thanksgiving and also so um, uh, that you can focus on your finals before, you know, so you have time to focus on your finals. Um, and then also this, if you follow this timeline, this also allows for you to kind of start planning for scholarships, right? Scholarships is something that you want to think about um, throughout the year, but if you want to kind of have a focus on college applications first and then, and then scholarships, this would be a good kind of timeline to follow is, you know, fo uh, focus on your applications through um, November and then into December, January, February is when you really kind of um, focus on applying for scholarships or looking for scholarships. And then admissions decisions for four-year bound um, students, for your uh, college bound students, um, typically roll out mid-February to mid-April. And then May 1st is when you actually have to decide where you wanna attend, where what school you wanna um, you know, tell, uh, make it official that you wanna attend there for the fall. For community college bound students, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, but, you know, typically the, um, for you to apply for a community college will start in November, um, December, uh, and you want to do it early because of those programs that I just mentioned. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, take, do your research on different programs. Um, I know you have an extended amount of time because it is sometimes it's rolling dates. It's not as early as a deadline to apply for a community college, but, um, do a, try to finish everything early so that you can actually take advantage of some of those great programs that the community college offers. Um, and remember to use your resources like the Saddleback Counselors. Um, but yeah, that, that's it on community college bound students. And then for alternative pathways, you know, explore your options early. You know, you can start exploring. And what we mean by alternative pathways is like, um, you know, a tech program, a technical program, or, you know, like an electrician, or if you want to go into HVAC, um, those are kind of the typical um, uh, alternative pathways, or like if you want to go into the military, um, those are um, what we're talking about in the alternative pathways. So you also want to explore those early on so you can plan accordingly. Um, and, e and the other option too, is that if you want to join the, the workforce, um, after high school too, that's something that you can plan for and we support. We help students with developing their resumes, with practicing for interviews. Um, so that's also something that you can plan for with, um, with our support. Um, but that's it on post-secondary options. All right, so um, let's talk about ordering transcripts. Uh, so a lot of students <laughs> make the mistake of doing this too early. They kind of freak out. They're like, I have to submit my transcript. Like I, and then they go into and ask their, you know, the, their guidance team at their school. Like I need an official transcript or, you know, they'll, they'll try to get one, but actually you don't, you don't, typically you don't need an official transcript. Um, not until after you graduate. And even then, um, if you need to submit a transcript is because typically the colleges will request for you to submit your official transcripts. So um, yeah, so don't worry too much about this. You'll, you'll get, um, you know, usually you'll, you'll have to order some transcripts after you've, you had that requested from the college. Um, 
And the way that you can actually request the transcript is that you, um, you can request one from your guidance team or, you know, sometimes still you're at your campus, they will have a specific process on the website where you can, um, you know, order it. Um, they use Parchment, which is an online ordering system. Um, and it's on, again, your high school guidance page. And the service is something that you have to pay for, uh, but it's really quick and easy. So don't worry too much about ordering transcripts. The way that you'll report your grades for college applications is you'll self-report them. You'll, you know, the colleges will um, ask you to submit all your classes and all the grades, um, and uh, they will take your word for it until they get your transcripts. So make sure that you're accurate on those. Um, but you don't have to submit transcripts not um, this early on. It's typically later, much later in the process of um, uh, the college process. Okay, so let's talk about testing. I know it's a big, big topic um, that um, a lot of students, especially like last year, as you were juniors, you were, you know, you were, had a lot of questions about, maybe you came to see some um, one of us to have a conversation about this. So um, let's talk about test, <laughs> testing again. Um, so what's happened this year is um, uh, some schools have gone test optional. They've, um, you know, put a temporary or they changed their, their, their testing policy temporarily um, just because of the many disruptions so that the pandemic has caused. So on here on this um, uh, slide, we have a lot of information about uh, different campuses and their policies. So you can see here, we have the UC, um, the CSU, um, and then also there is a list from FairTest that it's a very co a comprehensive list of campuses and what their test policy is. Um, you can sort by state. Um, uh, so all those, all these resources are going to be really um, helpful for you as you start exploring the campuses that you're interested in and seeing and determining what is their testing policy. Um, so that is going to be a resource for you that you can use. So um, with that being said, there is a lot of, um, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, you might have heard these terms a lot this last year. So it's optional, it's blind, it's flexible, um, and it can be confusing. Um, so I'm gonna go eat through each one just so we can clarify and we can all be on the same page. And so that when you view your school's policy that you, you know what they're talking about. And if you don't, email us, let us know, um, and we can um, hopefully clarify for you. So let's go through each one. Test optional. Uh, test optional means it's not mandatory, right? You don't have, you're not required to submit scores. Um, but what happens is that if you do submit scores, those scores will be reviewed as part of your application. But um, still your academic record is gonna be kind of the, the focus of your application or as they review your application, that's gonna be the most important criteria. So, um, you know, consider that if you do submit scores for a test optional campus, um, that means that they will review your scores. And if you don't, that's completely fine too. You won't get penalized. Um, so that's test optional. Test blinds, again, that means you're not required to submit scores. But if you do submit scores, you, they will not be reviewed. They will, either regardless of whether you submit them or not, they, they, will, they will not be reviewed. Um, that's typical, but there are several variations of this testing policy. Um, so make sure that you review with each of the campuses. Um, so this is what the UCs and the CSUs, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the policy that the UCs and the CSUs have adopted. Um, so they are not requiring test scores. And if you submit them, they're not reviewing them. But um, they may use those scores for other purposes like course placement, like so for math or like um, for math or like writing or English, those kind of placements. And then also for um, meeting eligibility requirements if you need to submit scores um, for uh, admission eligibility. So that's test blind. Now test flexible is allows, uh, um, you know, students like yourself, your seniors, to submit various standardized test scores. So that could be, you know, it could be your SAT, your ACT, um, it could be your AP scores, your IV scores, your SAT subject test, 
So that'll depend on each campus. So again, you want to double check what the campus that you're interested in and determine um, if they are test flexible, what, what kind of tests they will, um, will they um, allow you to submit. Hopefully that was clear. If not, let us know in the Q&A. Okay, helpful tips regarding testing um, updates. So I know this is stressful. This has been stressful as you know, we've noticed as you know, as we were meeting with juniors last year, this has been a stress for many students since like last year around this time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we wanna kind of give you some testing tips so that you can um, have a better uh, understanding of what, how to move forward. So um, explore your options early, right? So do your research on what is the testing policy for each campus. On here, we linked again that list from Bear Test so that you can review um, the policy for many campuses. And then um, recommendations, whether you need to test or not to test, will vary by student and based on in situation. So if you're unclear about how to move forward, send us an email, um, come see us in an appointment, um, because yeah, those recommendations will vary. Um, um, by student. And then if you have not tested, don't stress, um, you know, colleges, institutions are very understanding. They know the challenges that you all have this last, you know, year with getting, being able to test, um, being able to manage online, online school for the last, you know, year, or even in person school and just the stress from the pandemic. So, they're very understanding of what's going on with each of, um, with, you know, potential applicants. And then um, admissions is an added process. That means that, you know, colleges, college admissions are not out to, you know, penalize students. They're there to, um, to, you know, to have a positive outlook on the student application. So anything you submit, like it doesn't work against you. It's more of a like, you know, if you include it in the application, that's great. We'll include it with the rest of what we're, what they're reviewing um, for your application. And then um, if you, um, you know, if you have not started your testing, um, your testing, I guess, journey or your, you know, your testing um, process, um, and this is like, you know, last ditch effort, like maybe you may consider that to focus on other things, right? To focus on other more important things like your college applications, your personal statements, um, you know, doing well in your classes, um, focusing on your sports and focusing on your mental health. Um, so this, if, you know, is if it's like you haven't started this process at all, it may be too late and it may be time to consider just up, um, looking at schools that may be test optional where the testing policy is a little bit more flexible where you don't have, you, you're not required to submit scores. Um, but again, so those are just tips. Hopefully that gives uh, everybody um, a better idea how to move forward. Okay, let's talk about financial aid. I like talking about financial aid. Um, uh, I, this is just a very brief, brief, brief overview of financial aid. If you wanna take a deeper dive on financial aid, during our college fair in October, we will have a session on financial aid. So if you wanna learn more about financial aid, you can join us for that. We also have some recordings from our previous financial aid um, webinars on our YouTube channel. So you can review those as well. Um, so this is just a very brief um, uh, overview of financial aid. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, financial aid is a multi-step process. Um, typically, it starts with um, students completing a federal application, no, free application for federal student aid, um, otherwise known as FAFSA um, or the California Dream Act. Um, so um, those are linked. I didn't put the link icon, but those are linked too. So if you wanna kind of check them out, those won't open until October 1st. So um, uh, you can start checking, applying for, um, submit your application for either one of these um, starting on October 1st. So they do open up pretty early and we do suggest that you apply early on um, so that you don't miss important deadlines. And typically also because sometimes you will get asked to make revisions on these applications 
or not typically, but some, some, some students may be, um, you know, they made a tiny mistake and they may have to go back and review those. So um, uh, make sure that you do this early on so that if you, you know, if you have questions, you need support, that there is time, there's enough time for you to receive that support. So um, this is one of the most inclusive, parent inclusive tasks because you will need um, financial information um, from, you know, your parent or guardian. So this is a kind of a collaborative effort that you'll have to do with your, with your family um, to make sure that you successfully complete it. Um, and, uh, and for financial aid, that's, that includes grants, scholarships, loans, um, and work study options. So, uh, so financial aid kind of is an umbrella term for all these things that you may be eligible for. Um, let's see, we, I already mentioned the presentation for, um, for during our virtual college fair. Uh, so that's going to be really helpful for you all. If you can, hopefully y'all can join us and learn more about financial aid and hopefully we will have more, um, workshops available to help you submit this application in, um, later on this fall and then into early spring. Okay. So almost done, um, let's just, we're gonna cover a few more things and then um, we hopefully we can get you out of here um, early, maybe early. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about uh, college essays and um, letters of recommendation really briefly. So letters of recommendation. So um, there is a process um, for each high school has their own process of, you know, for students requesting letters of recommendation um, and their own deadlines. So um, make sure that you um, are not aware of those yet, that you do, you know, check your high school's guidance website, um, email your, your guidance team. Um, but typically, you know, they'll use a Google form for you to request those letters of recommendation. Um, the information that you include there is very important. So make sure that you take your time, that you're paying attention to what you submit, because um, that information is very important for them, for whoever is writing that letter of recommendation to write you a letter of recommendation. Um, so there is a separate form too for parents and teachers. So um, that's on the web, um, typically it's also on the school's um, guidance website. Um, make sure that you plan ahead whenever possible. Um, you know, most people, if you're asking for a letter of recommendation, you want to give them enough time for, the, for them to write you a good letter of recommendation that you don't want them to rush um, through writing you a letter of recommendation that, that might not be a, um, reflective of who you are, that might not cover everything that all the amazing things that you've done. Um, so make sure that you plan ahead and um, uh, waive your FERPA rights. So um, Kristen covered FERPA, right? So this is, you know, student, it's a law that kind of covers student education privacy. Uh, so if during your, um, when you're submitting requesting letters of recommendation, you want to, um, or requesting letters of recommendation, you want to waive your FERPA rights um, so that the process is faster and more direct. So me, when you waive your FERPA rights, that means that you won't be able, typically you're not able to review those letters of recommendation. And you want to waive that right so that colleges who are receiving those letters of recommendation know that whatever is on there is candid and truthful. Um, so if you don't waive, it kind of seems like, you know, you want to, you want to review those letters, you want to um, see those letters. So typically you want to waive, uh, we recommend that you waive your FERPA rights. Um, and one more thing, I did get a really good question um, today, actually, about letters of recommendation and who you should ask for letters of recommendation. So it, um, specifically, like with teachers, right, should I, is there specific teachers, like if I'm a, a STEM major, um, should I be asking my science teachers or my math teachers for those letters of recommendation? Our general guidelines for requesting a letter of recommendation is that you request letters of recommendation from people that, um, you know, adults that know you really well, that can speak on your character, that can speak on maybe some of the things that you've been successful at, um, like special projects or something like that. So typically um, the content of the letter is more important than who is writing the letter. So also think about that, right? Who is someone that, <clears throat> that has known me and knows like my strengths 
um, and that's the person I, you want to ask um, to write your letter recommendation. And Monica, one thing that I would add um, regarding letters of rec and, and college essays as well is that they're not required by all colleges. Oh yes, right. So um, for those of you in your are like, oh crud, like I have to get a letter of rec, <laughs> not necessarily, right? The mm -hmm. UCs and the Cal States don't require letters of rec, mm -hmm. for example. So this is not going to be a requirement of all colleges, um, but some. So you'll need to check their requirements. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so let's hit on letters of recommendation. And for college, uh, let's talk about college essays. So um, college essays are more typical for students who are applying to four-year colleges and universities. Um, the, the essays will be part of, you know, the application. So they'll be reviewed as part of your application. And according to NACAC, um, uh, a NACAC survey, these essays kind of account for 20% of your candidate review. So they're really important. Um, they're a really important, important component of the application. So you want to take some time in, you know, writing your essays, writing multiple drafts, getting somebody to review them. Um, so as we mentioned, they're not required by every four-year college or university. Um, so you want to, again, pay attention to um, um, those admission requirements um, for the campuses that you're interested in. Um, so um, if you're applying to campuses through the Common App, there are um, seven prompts options. You'll choose one option and um, you'll have to write a response to 150 words. Um, and also some colleges may have supplemental essays that you'll have to submit. So um, again, review the campuses that you're interested in to see if there are any other essays that you may have to write so that you can start writing those if you haven't already. And then one thing that is kind of different since we're in COVID times is that they have the optional COVID question. Um, so this is a, a space for you to, um, to talk, it's not a, a sp additional space for another essay, that's not it. It's a space for you to talk about if there are any significant impacts on you on um, uh, because of COVID. Um, those could be, for example, like, you know, someone in your family lost, you know, maybe a, par a parent lost their job, so there was a change in income. Uh, maybe your mental health was like severely affected. Um, one thing that we've noticed too is that some students struggled with access to internet um, through the pandemic, so that affected their learning. Um, so th that's what the COVID question is. It's not for like, oh, you know, my my school's um, post like canceled sports. Um, that's something that you know usually um, colleges are already aware. It's more like a severe kind of situation, um, or if um, COVID um, had a significant impact in your life. So um, for the UC app, um, there are eight um, prompts. They're called the personal insight questions or the PIQs. Um, you'll choose four and they're very short responses, 350 words. Um, that's how much you're allowed to write. And so you have to be concise, straight to the point. Um, all three of us um, have reviewed applications for the UCs. So we're very familiar with, um, with these prompts and we can definitely support you with um, with developing these these responses um, and then also there is a space for you to again kind of if there is um, a significant impact due to the pandemic you can include that information in a section called the additional information this is where you can include it and the good news is if you're applying to cal states there's no ready supplement um, so um, that's it on college essays. I know Kristen's going to talk about how we're going to support you on with this. So um, I think that was it from me. Yes. Thank you all. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Kristen. Thank you so much, Monica. That was a really big chunk of information. Um, like both of my colleagues have said earlier, this presentation is not only recorded, but these slides will be sent out. I know we've mentioned a lot of the links they are available on the slides. Um, I wanna briefly go over what the senior supports that our team is offering look like so that you all know what to expect as we move throughout the fall. Um, and then we're gonna move into the Q&A portion. So if you have a question that you feel like is really burning and you'd like to make sure that you have it addressed um, before we close out tonight, feel free to start using that Q&A feature and we'll definitely get to all of those. Um, so what will happen moving forward throughout your senior year 
is you're going to be receiving a monthly newsletter that is sent out every month that details the most important deadlines that are coming up, things that you should be thinking about for your planning. That is actually going to begin on Monday, August 30th. So you'll receive your first newsletter on Monday. Those are available in English and Spanish. Um, those are sent out through School Messenger, so be on the lookout for those. There's also a folder that will be on our website if you want to access previous um, months' newsletters or if you want to take a look at some of those that are in there, they'll be on our website as well. Um, our webinar Wednesdays are also going to continue throughout September. So each Wednesday, we have a scheduled webinar to go over a specific college topic. We're going to be talking about the UC Personal Insight questions on their own. We're going to be talking about how to complete your Common App and your Common Application. Um, we're talking about the differences between the Cal States and the UC system. For parents, we're also having a parent boot camp that's coming up really quickly that discusses admissions, how you support your child, what the best options are for you as you kind of go through this for the first time. Um, it's a great event if you haven't attended previously. That is going to be remaining throughout the month of September to really get you set up to be successful as you, more of your applications open in October and November. Throughout September, we're also hosting college list check-ins. Those are 15-minute slots with a counselor. You do meet virtually via Zoom, where you can get feedback about your college list. If you feel like your options are good, you have a nice variety of reach, target, and safety schools, or if you're really struggling to find schools that you're interested in, your counselor can make some recommendations for you. Beyond that, we always have one-on-one -on -one appointments to meet with students. Those also open on Monday, um, August 30th. So it's happening very, very soon. For the first time ever, we're able to offer appointments at Cabo Valley High School, Elisa Miguel High School, and Dana Hills High School. Um, our college and career centers are open there. We will also be opening additional college and career centers at the remaining three high schools throughout the rest of this year. So hang tight. If your school is not fully set up yet, we're coming. Um, those open on Monday for everyone else to book. So if you feel like you'd like additional support, you really want to sit down with a counselor and go through your plan or your options, those are always available for you. Um, beginning in October and November, we will have what are called college application and college essay drop-in times. Those actually happen at our Cal Prep campus. Um, the link that's available on this slide is actually it includes the address um, so you know exactly where to go. Those rotate on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So on Tuesdays, we cover college applications. And on Thursdays, we cover college essay work or writing supplements only. That space is a drop-in, meaning there's no appointment required. It's a block of time. Usually, it's two to three hours. It's just an open space for students to work and to ask questions from our counseling team to make sure that they're filling out something appropriately, they've entered something from their transcript the right way, or if they want someone to review their essays before they submit them. That's all the way through the end of October and November before submission time. So there's plenty of time to start if you haven't even thought about that yet. Our YouTube channel has multiple presentations from previous years, many from last year, that are recorded that discuss how to fill out the Cal State application or the UC application, in particular the UC activity section and how to phrase some of those um, pieces if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, our YouTube channel is a great place to start. Like Monica and B mentioned, some of your applications are not even open yet. So if you haven't started this process or you're still trying to figure out what the best route for you is after high school, that's totally fine. That's really what this webinar is to help get your gears going to do and for us to help support you through that process. Beyond that, we are always available via social media on Instagram and Twitter, and we're always available via email. Um, I know some of you who signed up to attend this webinar this evening had very specific questions. And we tried to reach out to most of you to address those if I knew that we were not gonna cover any of those things this evening. So if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, moving forward, we're gonna open it up to answer some of these questions that I see coming in, which are super, super helpful. Um, and then there's a little post survey and we'll wrap up and get you all out of here for dinner. One more plug because I have to. Sure. College fair, everybody. Okay. Oh, yeah. October 18th through October 24th, first, the October 21st, four days in October that we are dedicating to college events for you. Showcases with reps, little mini ones with just six colleges at a time. This is your chance to explore fit. This is your chance to corner a rep after their presentation and ask them specific questions online. Okay, so please check out our page. We'll be updating it soon so you can see the full schedule of events. 
highly recommend that you go so that you can actually speak to college reps and get a sense of what's out there and learn about what you don't know, right? About what schools are out there. Kristen, did you wanna roll out this poll really quickly before we jump into Q&A? Yes, absolutely. So because All our right. is open on Monday, we wanna make sure that we have enough variety planned. I think we do between the options that we have scheduled, but I wanna make sure that we are able to meet you all where you are or where you'd like to meet with us. So I'm gonna launch this last poll, which is just where would you like to meet with a counselor? What is your preference? Let us know here. I'm gonna start addressing some of these questions in the Q&A. Some of them I'll try to answer live because they, I think they apply to other students too. Um, and we'll get through, I know all of these by, by the end of the evening for sure. Right. Results are coming in hot. Thank yeah. you for responding to the poll. All right, looking good. Yeah, this is very helpful information, all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. We can wrap up this whole poll in about 10 seconds. I know that some of you are still responding, but we have about a 72% response rate, which is great. So if everybody can chime in with what they, they prefer. That's going to help guide how we support you for the remainder of the school year as well. It's wonderful to see that most of you would like to meet with us on your high school campuses. We agree. We're super, super excited to be back on high school campuses for the first time this year, um, not just because of COVID, because we've never had a designated office space there. So I know that that need is there. We know that you all want to meet with us there, and I'm so happy to hear you say that. We're definitely working on it. So um, don't stress. San Clemente, San Juan, and Tesoro. We're getting there. We're doing it. <laughs> and then a lot of you still prefer Zoom. Awesome. I'm going to end this poll. And then we're going to start talking through some of these questions. Um, I'm going to start at the top where I see some of these. And Monica and B, if you feel like you can answer some in a more concrete way, please feel free to chime in. Um, where in the application process should I be right now? This is a great question. I think the place that most students are, depending on their goals, is putting together a timeline of what applications they need to complete and what does their college list look like? Is their college list ready or is their plan concrete? Do they know for sure they're applying to a four-year university? Do they know for sure they're applying to a community college? Those are things that you should be working through before you even start the application process. I would say most students are starting right there. Um, at this point in the school year, they're determining exactly what their concrete plans look like. Beyond that, they're figuring out exactly what applications they will need to complete. Really, most students are here. Um, I know that there's a lot of chit chatter about, well, my friend's already done their essay or my friend has already completed their common app. Honestly, it's pretty rare. Um, and I will tell you from experience at our drop-ins, most students, if they work quite a bit ahead in their application process or cycle, end up changing or rewriting their essay, making sure and triple, quadruple checking their application. So it's not always advantageous to start super, super early. Um, the Cal State application, for example, is not open until October 1st. You can't even fill it out yet. Um, so you're already ahead of the game by asking questions, by attending an event like this and understanding what your general timeline is. Most students throughout the month of September are making those plans more concrete and just figuring out the websites that they need to utilize um, and working with their counselor to figure out if they need letters, if they need to test or report their test scores and things of that nature. I hope that that answers your question. Please let me know if it does not. Um, Danielle has a wonderful question. Does it put you at a disadvantage when it comes to college acceptance to apply undecided for a major? B or Monica, do you have thoughts about applying undecided? Uh, applying undecided. I think it's perfectly fine if you are undecided. Um, there's nothing wrong with it at all. If you truly don't know, that's okay. Um, keep in mind that a lot of colleges, um, even if you are undecided, they might have you be undecided in a particular college within the university. So undecided 
biological sciences or under undecided humanities or undecided social sciences, right? So um, this is part of the research process as well is um, if you think you might be undecided to look into if you have to make that decision for that campus, um, you know, do I have to choose undecided in a particular college? But to me, if you truly don't know, that's a viable option. Agreed, yes, 100%. The one thing or one caveat that I'll add to that answer is if you are interested in, in a major that is super impacting, meaning there's lots of students that are really, really interested in that major as well, like engineering or nursing, for example, where the actual major or program at an institution is pretty small, um, you'll want to consider or understand if your application is reviewed, if you declare or if you choose not to. Um, sometimes those programs, because they're so popular or so impacted, students might not be able to transfer in or change into that major after their freshman year. So knowing that upfront would just be good information to have. And if I might jump in, I do have a question that I wanted to answer. Yeah. Um, so I had a question from Mary about the Saddleback application process. Um, so she asked, do, do they need to submit SAT scores, essays, letters of recommendation? The answer is no, you do not need any of those things to you know, enroll at uh, Saddleback or to be able to apply to Saddleback. Um, the application typically will ask you like personal information, you know, what, what kind of student you're gonna be. You're gonna say you're gonna be a freshman student, but they do not require SAT scores, um, essays or letters of recommendation. So easy peasy. Um, um, I have a question about how you make appointments, which is great since those open for most students on Monday. If you attend Elisa Miguel, Capa Valley, or Dana Hills High School, feel free to email us. Most of those links are, are readily available. They're not on the website yet, but it's a little bit easier to schedule with you directly since those centers are open. If you attend any of the other three schools or if you'd like an appointment that's online or in the evening, those will all go live on the website on Monday. So hang tight, I promise they're coming. Um, we really wanted to give you all a week or two of school to just get back into the groove of things. Um, but yes, you will have to book through our Calendly system to book a one-on-one -on -one appointment. They're typically 30 to 45 minutes um, and it's completely uninterrupted time that's just for you. So it's, it's a really unique and special offering that we're able to have. And I, I hope that students you know, feel free to take advantage of it. So there will be a lot of times open. They roll on a 30 day basis. So if you feel like there's no appointments or no availability, if you get to the booking page, know that more will open up week by week. Um, so it's never an option where you won't be able to speak with a counselor or anything of that nature. Okay, um, we have some questions about guaranteed admission and the UCs. So are you guaranteed admission if you are in the top 9% for the UCs? You are guaranteed admission to a UC. That does not mean a UC of your choice. Um, students who are in the top 9% of their local area, their eligibility index for their local area, are notified via mail from the university system themselves. Um, so it's not something that your counselor necessarily will even know in terms of your designation. It's not something that will be on your transcript. The university system themselves will let you know that you qualify. Um, they'll send you a letter and a detailed an email with information about that qualification, but you are guaranteed to a UC, but not the UC of your choice. Okay, let's see some of these other ones. Okay, a lot of questions about recommendations, letters of recommendation. So let's clarify some of those. Can you ask a music teacher or a coach to write an additional letter of recommendation? Yes, you can. Um, most schools will ask that you have one teacher in a core subject, and then they'll give you options for the amount of other recommenders that you will add. Um, I have some questions here as well about how do you add them to your actual application? We are gonna talk about that in depth in our Common App um, webinar that's coming up on the 15th. So. Don't worry about that. I promise it's coming. You don't need to do it just yet. I know you don't have any deadlines before October 1st or November 1st, so it's coming. Um, it's actually a pretty simple um, system. It's pretty easy to do, but it does require a sequence of steps that I think sometimes gets confusing for students. So we'll definitely be talking about that in the Common App webinar with the live application open if you have questions about letters of rec. So just hang tight about those. So we have a question about uh, WUI. Um, somebody asked about out-of-state schools that charge essentially um, similar to in-state tuition, right? And that 
is something known as WUI. It's an acronym that stands for the Western Undergraduate Exchange. It's an awesome program. It's essentially an agreement um, between all of these schools, Colorado and West of, that said, hey, listen, we have awesome public universities. You have awesome public universities. Let's try to get our students to mix and mingle among states and let's incentivize them to apply out of state at our in-state tuitions by offering them a tuition discount, okay? And so essentially under WUI, students uh, typically will pay no more than 150% of that state's in-state tuition. So you get a pretty steep tuition discount for a lot of out-of-state schools west of Colorado, okay? So if you wanna learn more about that, you can always schedule an appointment with us. Um, look up WUE, W-U-E, or Western Undergraduate Exchange to learn more. It's definitely a great option. I'm trying to type as fast as I can. I know, we are like yeah. fervently <laughs> typing to answer, to answer your questions. most of these. So um, Mateo asked if you can book an appointment right now. Our appointments will officially open on August 30th on our website. So visit our website on August 30th. Um, it, we are currently a team of three. So we are um, a little uh, smaller than we typically are as far as uh, counselors go. Um, so bear with us. If availability is not um, to your liking or it doesn't suit your schedule, again, like Kristen mentioned, we do open up appointments on a 30-day rolling basis. So always check back because more appointments will continue to open up as the semester goes on. Um, we have a question about the UC application as well. So depending on your um, designation for honors or weighted courses, your UC application and your Cal State application actually does this as well. We'll recalculate your GPA. If you have questions about what your UC or Cal State GPA is, please email our team. Um, we're happy to, to walk you through a little bit more specifically about that. But because they only use your 10 through 12 grades, some of your courses might not appear as if they're giving you your honors credit or as if they're calculating into your total GPA calculation. Your GPA can look a little bit different than what's reflected directly on your transcript. Um, that's because of your A through D courses. So it's nothing's wrong with the, with the application. It's working correctly. Um, but let us know if you have questions about how that's calculated or what yours looks like in comparison to um, what you see on your transcript or any of those things. Let me see if I can dig up a link for you right now um, to help you calculate your own UC GPA. I'll pop it in the chat if I can find it. Awesome. Thank you, B. Um, some more questions about letters of recommendation. Um, how many letters would you suggest that you get? Only what's required from your school. Um, if you do submit optional letters, it will tell you very clearly on most applications that they might be read, they might not be. Um, so if it's optional, it truly means optional. Um, the amount of recommendations will vary by school. Most schools require your counselor or assigned advisor, number one, always. That one is the one that's required. And typically at least one teacher in a core subject or course. Um, anything additional to that will be specified on the application itself. So it's not something where you need to be worried about asking five teachers for letters of recommendation and that will make your application better. They'll be very, very specific for each school, what they require or what they would like. Um, and then some more information about the Google form request. So all schools use a Google form to let your counselor or advisor know that you need a letter of recommendation. It will include or prompt you to add your deadlines, what schools you're applying to, and it will ask you some basic questions about yourself. Um, there's typically a parent form also where parents can weigh in about their student, what they're really proud of, what they feel is you know, some of their more exceptional qualities. Um, those are a part of the request process. Most counseling teams are gonna be going out to senior English or Govan Econ classes to explain what their deadlines and their process with the Google Forms will be in September. Um, so there definitely needs to be a little bit of leeway for them to have time to complete those. I think most schools um, request that students, if they are going to need a letter of recommendation, let their counselor or advisor know about a month ahead of time so that they have time to do that and make sure that it's written to be really successful for your application. Um, but that process is on each individual school website. We converted over to a Google form a few years ago from a paper-based form. So you're welcome. We're not using paper anymore. It's a lot easier. Um, but it is something that you'll have to do based on your teachers. 
Some more questions about when you're notified by a UC, if you're in the top 9% eligibility, usually within September or October, it's within the application season. Um, it varies year to year, but those are sent directly to your homes, like I said. So they shouldn't have gone out just yet, but they should be coming in the next, in the next few weeks. Um, let's look. Okay, can you still hear me? Because my, my headphones are dying, but um, <laughs> it's, it's gonna, yeah, hour, hour and a half. So uh, somebody asked a really good question. So they said, hey, if I'm top 10% in my class right now, mm -hmm. um, but by the end of senior year, I, I end up being top 9% of my class, is there any way to work that into the college apps decision? Unfortunately, no. Um, college Colleges will start making their admissions decisions for you um, sometimes before your first semester grades will come out. Um, they're not going to have time to review those first semester grades before they make that decision, typically, depending on the school. Um, so it's going to be based on the grades earned through the summer after 11th, and that's pretty much it. They're going to see what you're enrolled in for 12th grade. They're going to see the level of rigor that you've maintained in your schedule. However, they're not going to see your grades, and that end of the senior year GPA is not going to be part of that calculus as far as your admission goes. Perfect. I want to answer your question. Um, I think all three of us can answer it is um, what are our hours for each particular college and career center? So I'll, I'll start. Um, so I am at Dana. Um, there is a college and career center there. So if you're there, come see me on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, on Wednesdays, I'm there from 12, excuse me, 11 to six. Um, typically it is through scheduled appointments, but I have drop-in times like during breaks, during uh, like lunch. Um, and then on Thursdays, I'm there from 11 to three. And again, it's usually, typically I see students based on appointments, but you can come drop in during breaks too. And I'm at Alicia Nagel High School. I'm in the College and Career Center, room 500, right next to the library. There's usually a big sign outside my door. I'm at Alicia Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So between tutorial and well after school, I will be available to you Tuesdays and Thursdays for one-on-one -on -one appointments and for drop-ins during lunch. So please come visit and say hi. I am at Capital Valley on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and sometimes on Friday if I can finagle it. Um, I'm usually there from lunch until 5 or 6 p.m., uh, depending on the evening. Um, lunch is open forum, so as soon as the College and Career Center is open, um, lunch is a free time to come ask questions um, and check in. If you need something really quickly, I'll be there. Um, the College and Career Center at Capo is actually going to be opening on September 9th, so it's in the library, so the library, if you've been to Capo Valley, is under construction currently, so we are on a really tight schedule. It will be open and beautiful by September 9th, but you can still book an appointment now um, that will be ready as soon as the center is, is up and running, but Tuesdays and Thursdays for me. Yeah. And I forgot to mention the room number. You, you both reminded me. I'm in room 501. That's where the um, Career Center, Southland Destination is at. But no matter where you are, you have access to us, either at the mall or, of course, online from the comfort of your own home. Um, we're here for all of you. Awesome. I think that was most of our questions. Do we have any more? We have a few more about the UC designations that I'm actually going to type out specifically right now. Um, if you have time, please feel free to fill out our exit survey. Let us know if this is what you thought it would be, if you were expecting some other type of information. Um, I know we put the slides and some other um, helpful tips in the chat box. Feel free to use those and those links at your disposal in your planning. Um, we'll also send out the slides and the recording of this presentation once it's uploaded to YouTube. Um, so be on the lookout for that if you ever need to reference back or if you want to look at an additional slide, they're always available for you. Um, please feel free to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, like I said, especially for students. We're going to have a lot of upcoming events for the fall, a lot of ways that we're able to support you, and we'll be posting about all of your upcoming deadlines and expectations. So we're definitely here to make sure you know when things are happening um, and, and how we can help. Um, but thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are going to wrap up or answer the last few questions, um, but feel free to take our exit survey and we'll see you sometime this fall. We'll see you all soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful senior year. We are so excited for you. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. All right. So let's look at some of the top 9% questions. So what does it mean to be in the top 9%? It means that you're in the top 9% of all eligible California students 
um, in high school. So within your local area. So that's what it means to be in the top 9%. Um, if you're in decile one, how do you know if your child is in nine, the top nine instead of the top 10%? You won't know until the university notifies you. So if you're already in the top 10% or in decile one, you're doing awesome. Um, you'll be notified from the university system soon if you qualify within that top nine designation. Um, we have some questions about examples of a G requirement. So anything within A through G, the G requirement is your elective class. So typically that's any other class that you take like your visual performing art, um, an extra year of your language, anything beyond the minimum in your A through G can count as one of your elective courses. And we'll talk a lot about that. We do talk a lot about that in the CSU um, application webinar and how you code those classes. If you have any questions about that, let us know because it is, I think a little bit tricky the first time you do it, but it's pretty easy once, once you get going. Awesome. Monica, what were your days and hours at Dana? I am at Dana uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays, Wednesdays at 11 to six and Thursdays 11 to three. Got it, thank you. I'm just responding to a student. Okay, Lydia, how are college classes added to your transcripts? They're typically not. Um, when you take a college course, you have the option to add it to your high school transcript. Um, most students actually don't. They just submit both their official college transcripts and their high school transcripts. Um, if you're taking a college class, you will add the college itself to any application that you complete. Um, even if you're applying to community college, you'll add that you have college courses to submit. Um, once you do that, you'll be able to manually add in whatever courses you or your student has taken. Um, so if they've taken their art class at Saddleback, for example, or a foreign language class or an elective class, they'll be able to add that to their application and they'll be able to match it to satisfy their A through G requirements. For example, um, if a student is using those core classes or the community college to, to qualify that way. Um, but typically they're not added to your high school transcript unless you specifically request it. Um, you just added in your own on the application. I know that's surprising for most parents and students that you self-report so many things and that you're trusted to do that, but it works out well actually. Um, and most students know exactly how to enter things um, on their transcript. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your great feedback. We really appreciate you. Nico, the recording will be on YouTube. I'm hoping to have any awkward moments edited out by Friday. So we'll get that uploaded as soon as possible. I'm not a master YouTube editor yet, but I try my best. So we'll get that uploaded by the end of the week for sure. Yeah, I appreciate all the lovely comments you're all leaving on the yeah. Q&A. So yeah. If you all have any extra um, questions, I'm gonna close out the Q&A for now. Please, please feel free to email our team. Um, I know in a span of an hour and a half, we're able to cover a lot, but obviously not every single thing for you know specific student needs or student questions. Um, but it was great to have you all here. Thank you for kicking off our first event on such a great note. Um, and we'll see you soon.